Uh, thank you, Ed. So I will share my screen. I have um, put it all on the same PowerPoint just for an easy life instead of separating them out. Yeah, so for those of you that haven't kind of seen where we're at, um, Deep Lab Cut is basically a pose estimation piece of software. Um, it's available on PIP, um, so you can download it on Python, Anaconda, um, and create your own kind of environment. Um, applications, I am just going to skip through this part quickly because obviously I have already done this bit, but just for those, just as a bit of a recap. Um, it extracts user-defined body part locations. Um, and some kind of applications are tracking mice in open fields, pose estimation in babies, um, and 3D locomotion studies in rodents. Um, here is kind of an, a big overview. Um, so it shows a convolutional neural network here. Um, it's got the points in dots, and then it's got these trailing points. So the trail, the line shows where the point was, and now where the point is. So that's how that eye has moved through that that video. So each each one of these dots will be in a new frame, depending on what your frame rate is. And then they've then plotted this on um, an X, Y, Z graph with three different points. Um, I'm going to zoom, zoom through these parts. We've done these bits. So just to recap the actual folder structure, um, we went using the GUI, so the user interface that was provided by Deep, Deep Lab Cut, and we went on there and we created a project. Now, by creating that project, we ended up with four folders and one YAML file. Um, these folders were named as part of when you create a project, you get a DLC dash models, models um, standing for Deep Lab Cut. You get labeled data folder, a training data sets folder and a videos folder. And you also get your config.yaml, which is where you specify the specific points or body parts that you're interested in tracking. Um, here we went into detail on how the config.yaml file is um, organized. Um, so you've got your project path here, which is the location of where your movies are. Um, here you've got information on the movies, so 64 by 48 is the size of each video, um, and then the body parts that you're interested in. Again, just a little bit more detail here on what kind of training. So the default net type is a ResNet underscore 50, um, and your batch and score size is 8. So we did a, a little video here that showed how to actually label the frames. So the next part of part number three of this kind of series of deep lab cut is we're looking at how we take these labeled frames and now train the model to give it a video without any labels on for it to label itself. Um, so here we go, part three. So just a summary, step one, we identified positions in the form of poses on a small subset of data. Um, this is otherwise known as the training data. Step two, train the model to identify poses on unseen data known as the test data. And step three, analysis of poses to predict the behaviours. So we've done step one, um, and this part is part of the step two of the whole deep lab cut framework. The actual step three, uh, analysing the poses to predict behaviours, is a whole new kind of kettle of fish. Um, there's multiple different GitHub repros. You can use Simba. Um, which is why I want to do another session on this, you, but you can also use other different tools. Um, some of them are kind of really raw statistics, time series stuff. Um, so I kind of want to spend a little bit more time on understanding all the different applications and then this picking the best one for my purpose, um, the purpose of my data. So we basically are now looking at training the network. Um, you can see here you've got each layer and then you've got a, a convolutional layers and it's basically saying that they used ResNet um, to do that, to do theirs. Now ResNet, I'm just going to go back one step back and talk about convolutional 
um, neural networks. Now, each of these pullers represents a layer and each of these dots within that layer represents a node. So what makes a convolutional neural network a convolutional neural network is it has this convolutional layer um, and it, usually they have at least one and that makes it different to the standard neural network. Now, earlier on in one of the slides, I did put a video for StatQuest um, and that goes into depth on, on explaining a neural network and I'd really recommend watching that video just for that basic kind of understanding. Um, you, you may not believe it, but the actual first convolutional neural network was introduced in 1998, um, so 25 years ago, um, and it's called LeNet5 architecture, and that was actually used on the minced data set, which is the one where they had loads of different numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, um, and those numbers were all drawn by different um, different handwriting styles, but they still wanted to detect what the digit actually was. Um, now, this is a convolutional layer, um, and basically what a convolutional layer, so every uh, CNN, so convolutional neural network, has one or more convolutional layer. Now, what a convolutional layer enables is it, it provides a deeper feature map. So you can see how we've got this convolutional, we've got the input image here, then we've got this um, convolutional layer over here, and then it's pulled together, so just bringing everything closer together, and then a further convolutional layer, and you can see how it is deeper, so there's kind of more kind of feature maps in there. Um, now, the number and arrangement of these convolutional layers, pooling layers, and other different layers that they've introduced along the way, of what determines a specific type of convolutional neural network. Um, now, it's very easy to get bogged down in understanding a convolutional layer, a pooling layer. Sometimes you see Re ReLU, uh, Softmax. There's many different types. Um, and the organization and the structure and the number of these different layers and the different types of these layers gives rise to these different CNNs. And these different CNNs have got different jargon term names so some of them you, that you'll have heard of is AlexNet, um, Google Net, and VGGNet um, and the other one that we're interested in is the ResNet and the ResNet is what has been mainly kind of used for the deep lab cut framework. So what makes a ResNet kind of juicy? Um, when we talk about ResNet we're talking about a residual network and a residual network carries out residual learning so the green area here is the residual learning part of a convolutional neural network. You can see how in this kind of green section, you've got this black kind of rhombus type shape forming. Um, and this shows a skip connection. Now, a skip connection means that the information that's coming from here, instead of being fed just directly to this layer here, it actually gets fed directly into the output. So you've got information going in two places, not just one. Normally it would probably just go into one and that is the next layer. Whereas here it kind of goes into the next layer, but it also goes into that output. Um, and that it, it, this happens like throughout, so you could have multiple residual units within a, within a convolutional neural network. Um, and there is different types of ResNets, just to make it more jargon, is you've got ResNet 50, you've got ResNet 101, you've got ResNet 152. So there's lots of different ResNets, and that means they've got different arrangements of convolutional uh, layers, pooling layers, and residual units, so the residual layer. So each residual unit is basically just a small neural network within itself. Um, so obviously these are just stacked above on top of each other. Um, and I put this juicy peak here because obviously that is uh, what makes the ResNet juicy. And another benefit of, of the ResNet is that because it is feeding information directly into the above layer, but also into the output, is it actually can train a network a lot quicker. Um, so the next part of this is analyzing the coordinates to extract movement and behaviors which is 
they're analysing novel videos, but we need to first get to a point where we can actually train um, a ResNet model to be on our specific data, specific data set and be able to point out those exact poses as it's moving through the frames. So that's basically what I'm going to show you today. So I'm just going to go off here. So when we um, when we actually created our project, this was the folder structure that we got. Um, it was in my folders, happy as day in there. Um, and I basically have taken this folder structure and I've put it into my Google Drive. That's so, so I can access free GPU. However, I did end up paying for the GPU, which cost me something like £9.50 a month. Um, I got 100 computes. And it's actually, I think it's pretty actually quite affordable, really. Um, but I don't spend much on my phone contract, so I guess it just kind of evens itself out on technology spend for the month. Um, so what I've actually done is put it into my Google Drive. So if I go into my drive now, um, now mine, I have, I don't want to run it again because obviously it's costing me money now, um, but I've already run it. Um, and you can see my output in CalCam. Um, so you can see I've got a few new folders here. So my new folders are test. That's a new folder that I created. Evaluation results and this IPNYB checkpoints folder, which is where I've saved the weights at, at checkpoints. Because if you are using a free GPU, um, you can't just leave it running. You have to be there to like, you know, wiggle your mouse. Well, if you want to leave it and then it kind of shuts off, you can go back to the last saved iteration, change it within your YAML file to where you then want to train from. So you're not retraining the same model again um, from the beginning. You can basically go, go back a few steps. So this is how I kind of started training it. I've got the first line of code, which is installing the deep lab cut. Now it's got a lot, a lot of dependencies. Um, yeah, quite a lot. And there is some issues with TensorFlow, so I have to actually kind of restart my um, notebook every time I wanted to import Deep Lab Cut. Um, then I import my OS and I'm basically saying Deep Lab Cut, load it in light mode only. Um, and that basically means that I can't do any of the labeling that I've done previously. So this is kind of the additional step that you've got to do. So initially I was working locally. Now I've got what I've created locally, my labels that I've done my labeling with. So for example, if you're working with YOLO, we've done the YOLO mark part. Now we're doing the YOLO training part. Then I import Deep Lab Cut and it tells me the exact Deep Lab Cut um, version that I'm in. It confirms that I can't use any uh, interface. I can just literally access the arguments within the Deep Lab Cut package. Then I need to mount my Google Drive and it'll come up with a kind of um, pop up. It'll ask you to authorize it. And then I just want to list my direct directory. Um, this is just kind of peace of mind. And then I'm I've got to tell it where everything is. Otherwise, it's not just going to find it itself. So I say, OK, project folder name and I've put the, my name of my project folder. Um, then I'm specifying my project path, my video file path which is just in videos and the path underscore config underscore file. So this is the location of that config dot YAML file, which is what we've created when we did when we we're in the user interface. We'd already created that config YAML file and that is what I'd already uploaded into the Google it already existed. So I just uploaded it into the Google Drive. Then I'm just printing that information um, just to double check really. So I've got my new project path is in my drive CalCam George, my new path config file, which is in the exact same folder, but it's called config.yaml and the exact location of where my videos are. So let's just double check if I click on my videos folder over here, you can see I've got two videos in there. Now the, these videos are in total, one of them is two minutes 20 and one of them is one minute 15. Um, and it makes up three minutes and 35 seconds of video. Now, the reason I made a decision to reduce the number of videos that I was using for this kind of example and this learning curve was Your, that, yeah, go for it, Ed. Could I ask you just to um, increase the size of your screen a little bit, like control plus 
Just a little bit. Thank you. That's that's that a lot okay? better. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. Should have asked earlier. Um, and these videos are 640 by 480 in size. And I tried to figure out the exact kind of video quality parameter. And when I went on to, I used VLC Media Player, and it told me that they were coded as H.264 files. Now, I'm not going to lie, that means absolutely nothing to me. So I did some Googling, and it basically said that it is a good high quality video. Um, and the container that it's in is an MKV file. So they said that MP4, MKV are all types of containers for videos. Um, and these are H.264 quality and they're in an MKV container. And the size of them is 640 by 480. And in total, I've got three minutes and 35 seconds of training data. And I chose to train the labels at 20 frames per second. Um, so that means it took that video, it split it by, divided it by 20, which gave me an X number of frames. And then each of those frames had a label and that label is shown as a coordinate in a CSV file. Um, here you can see I've got more than what's in that initial project folder. I've got evaluation dash results and I've got test. And the reason that I've got those things is because I've already trained my model. So these are all extra. Initially, if I go into my folder here, if I click into DLC models, I have got an iteration in there. Um, I've got train, which has got a log. And I've got um, test. Now that's because I attempted to train this in my um, on my computer and it didn't work. It just shut down my computer because I didn't have enough uh, processing power for it to even work. Um, so it just kind of didn't really do anything. It just put those files in there as placeholders. Um, but when you do it, and if you do not attempt to train the model on your local, that folder will just be empty. Um, then I create training data set. Um, now, what this is, what this basically means is I'm telling it the exact network time that type that I want to use. So I'm specifying that it's ResNet underscore 50. Now I'm just going to go back because earlier on I showed you this in the user interface. So can you see this here? Um, do I'll just do from front slide. So you should be able to see all the different ResNets here. So I could put any of these really in here um, because I know they exist in the deep lab cut um, framework. Because if I go into folders, I know it, I've got the deep lab cut folder because I'd already downloaded it in my users. Um, and if you click on deep lab cut, you've got all these different kind of models that you can use. So model do pose estimation. Um, and in one of these folders are the different types of models. So you've got um, ResNet, efficient net model, mobile net model. Um, they're all in there in different kind of folders, neural networks resnet.py. So there's a lot of information that's already within that package. Um, but we've got that information in Google Colab because we've installed that Deep Lab Cut um, library. Um, so this now is all set up for us to train. We've told it we want to do this and we've told it we want to do that. So now we're saying, OK, now train the network. So Deep Lab Cut dot train underscore network. We have to tell it the path to where our config file is. So that's that config.yaml file, specifying the number of shuffles. And we're saying display it as uh, 100 and save it as every thousand. So it as means iterations. Um, now, I initially had this on saving it as at 100 and it was, it was a car crash, it was horrendous. Um, it basically used up all of my disk space. So I was actually on 100 gig and I bought an extra 100 gigabyte and then realized why it was doing that. Uh, it's because I needed to change my save iters and delete all the other iterations that it saved. Um, here provides all the information um, on that model. So it says um, display it as there. Um, you've got your max input size, um, the mean number of pixels. So there's a lot of detail in here that I can't describe every single thing to you in detail because I don't know yet myself. Um, but I am aware of this multi step. Now, the reason that there is four groups here is because we are looking at four different um, 
poses, and that is the left ear, the right ear, the left nostril, and the right nostril. And what this means is this first number is the learning rate, and this number here is the number of iterations. So learning rate, iterations, learning rate, number of iterations. So I set it to 10,000. Um, and then you can see here, each iteration is shown every 100 because I've asked it to display every 100 iterations with the loss function um, next to it. Then what happened is all of these, um, all of this detail and information once the model was trained, it was in DLC models in iteration and it showed me um, going to train all of these snapshots. Um, so 7,000, 8,000, 9,000. And if I wanted to change, so if I wanted to go back and change it from point snapshot dash 9,000, I would go into this pose config.yaml file and I would just change the path on the initial weights because at the minute this is using the initial weights from the deep lab cut pose estimation tensorflow models um, but if I wanted to if I wanted to use mine I would literally just select um, kind of copy path there I'd have to delete the dot data dash 000 because that's uh, they don't require that they just need snapshot dash 9000 because it needs to use all three of these files not just a specific one of these files um, and that would go in there and then it would literally just start training using those weights from snapshot 9000 um, then I want to evaluate the network and this creates another folder which is called evaluation results um, in another iteration dash zero and it gives me a CSV um, and a folder with all of these kind of images in. Um, so let me just click on one of these images. So this is a frame um, that we've trained on. These circle dots are what the model has put on and these blue, um, the, the square ones, like the not the cross, but the plus, those are where I put the label and then that is where the model is trained on. Um, and there's one of those for every kind of frame. Obviously, frame rate was 20. So whatever that works out as will be the number of images within that folder. Now, this is all great, but obviously I wanted to see, OK, so I've built this model. Now, what does that mean in terms of um, my actual videos? So I wanted to put in a new video that my model hadn't seen. So at the minute, this model had only seen two videos. Now. That is quite small, really. And these videos, so the way the videos are created are um, five seconds before the animal has physically gone in, it starts recording. And five seconds after the animal has gone in, it starts recording. So in an ideal world, next time I do this, I actually want to trim the videos because I don't want that information because that's just taking up storage, taking up space. And it's just it's information that I don't really need. So in the future, obviously, I will trim all the videos down so they don't have that information. Um, but I didn't I didn't for this use case. So here I'm saying analyze videos I'm put in the path underscore config file. And within here, I have got the location of my video and I created a new folder called test just because I wanted it to be all in that in that folder. And then in there I have got um, what dash poses um, temp which is, I'll just click on it. I think it's already opened. Uh, here we go. So the this is now the new frames from that one video um, and they will have the pose estimations within the frame, which is all good, but we're more interested in, in, in the video because um, you just see more information at once instead of clicking through a load of um, images. Um, and then if we click on to, this one here, the plot poses, this provides us with all the images, um, but I've put them on the slide, so we'll talk through those in a moment on the slide. Um, and then we're saying save as CSV, which means we're getting a CSV file, which looks something, sorry, that's the meta pickle, the CSV file. Um, and it basically says, OK, on this um, frame, so frame, these are the frames in here, the scorer uh, in this column, you've basically got the X and Y of the left ear and then the likelihood 
of that existing within that uh, frame for that image. Um, and it keeps going right the way until right nostril, right nostril, right nostril, X, Y, and likelihood. Um, now this keeps going until all the frames have been looked at and they can see here the zero because nothing exists, which will be where my video has actually got no object in it. So therefore there is nothing to label because it does it's not there. Um, so now my next um, step is I want to, this here you don't have to do. Um, I did it because I wanted to just, you know, follow along. But you can filter predictions that have got kind of not very good um, likelihoods are no longer needed. So, for example, those zeros would more than likely be removed from this um, function here. Um, but the other thing that was important was plotting those, uh, collecting the plot dot po plot dash poses, which it was this code here, which gave me some graphs, and then this one here gave me the video with the points from that CSV layered onto top of the video that I that I'd. Um, used in my test folder so just to go over this one here and this one here i'm just going to go back to the powerpoint slide okay so yeah here um giving the model a new video created a new folder called test and put in the unseen video so this is the unseen video that i put in i'm going to click play um, takes a few minutes. You can see that time period there where nothing is happening within the video. Flip it around. Let's speed this whole thing up a little bit. Again, a little bit more. And there you go, there's a load of dead space, no cow. No cow, no cow, no cow. So obviously, I, in the future, I want to trim those videos so they don't have that that um, that information in there. Um, then the model has been trained, and we get this CSV, um, just like the one I just showed you. So left ear, left ear, and the likelihood, so the x and y coordinate of where that is within the within the frame, and then the likelihood of it existing there. Um, now, this is the unseen video, and this is when that CSV file, those points, have been overlaid onto the unseen video. Um, and this is the output that we get. It's not perfect, but it was only trained on two videos. So now it's saying, OK, that's the ear. It's good at detecting ears, but rubbish at nostrils. <laughs> George, I may have missed it because you've been going through a lot of <clears throat> um information but um how much uh how much training data did you use and did you did you train on just the three points left and right ear and the nose no i trained on four points uh left ear right ear left nostril and right nostril i used two videos and um, the total time in those videos was three minutes and 35 seconds but i think the actual amount of time where all four of those um body parts are present with a label is probably less than 45 seconds. So the, does does that mean that you um, if it's 45 seconds, does does that mean oh somebody's calling me? Hold on, I better take this. I'll ask my question in a moment. OK. <laughs> so I'm just going to I'm just going to keep going. So that was the unseen points. Um, and then when we did the plot dash poses that folder got created and it put us in there some graphs so just to explain these graphs so on the x on the y axis we've got the likelihood of a point existing within that frame um so the red line represents the right nostril so we can see that actually up here there is a high likelihood of the red right nostril being present within frame i don't know 50 i'd guess probably about 50. Um, and then we've got a really good, um, da -da -da -da, a really good likelihood of the right ear being present in frames just below frame 50. And then the second graph is, this graph here just showed us the likelihood, but this graph here shows us 
um, the actual presence based on X and Y um, positions. And you can see how it changes kind of throughout the video, um, goes up and down. But what I think is nice here is that, well, you guys might not think it's that nice, but the right ear and the left ear, because they're often in the frame together, they kind of are the same, which I guess as the head is moving, they're moving together, aren't they? Um, so I thought that was quite interesting. Um, the X is the dash line and the Y is the, is the solid line. And that just represents the coordinate within within the frame. And then graph number three is um, the just the X and Y position in pixels. So if that was the image, um, this would be the cow's ear. You can see it's moved up and down. This would be the other cow's ear moving up and down within that within that region, and obviously within this region here. Um, and that is basically everything that I have, pretty much. Well, this um, is I don't a know. good time. I'm sorry about that interruption for me to ask that question. Is if if you had 45 seconds of video total for the um for the where the cow's head was in the picture, does that mean that you you labeled um 45 times 20 frames per second uh, images for the ear and nostrils? Yeah, if my prediction of 45 seconds is correct. Yeah, yeah, okay. Could have been, just, could have been a bit. Wanted, yeah, could have been a, just, probably less. Okay, and then when you're testing them uh, to find that's that's new video that the model hasn't seen before, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, um, is it now? I know you're just exploring the functionality of this, but um, but uh, do you need more points? Do you think at the, what is your thinking at this point? Do you need more points or? Definitely, because the, if we just go back to the actual um, video yeah. that I had, <clears throat> there's actually a really long, I mean, you can see that this is the test video because it's actually so much quicker than the other video. It's like in fast speed. So you can see how quickly that cow's moving, but actually even there, um, like for example there, you can get this nostril here, but you can't get the other nostril. Um, here you've got the ears pretty well still, it's still identifying them. Um, but this ear here is pretty weak, and that's because a lot of the videos, the cows are actually over here on this far side doing that look. For some reason, they always look to that side, so you miss that kind of label. It, it doesn't kind of exist as much as this one. Um, so, yeah, there's a, a long way to go, but hopefully the more videos that I put in, the better it will it will be. And obviously the good good labelling quality, which we all know is really important with these kind of models. I just have a follow up question because ultimately uh, uh, the problem it's been so long since you started talking about this. Maybe there are some people who haven't even heard you talk about this yet. Uh, is uh, the ultimate problem you're trying to solve is uh, a way to automate a large amount of footage of um, cows eating to identify specific behaviors. And one of the behavior is is um, the um, the quantify the amount of time that are, are that the cow is feeding on the whole feed, and another kind of behavior is where they're doing something called sorting behavior, where they're picking out the good bits mm -hmm. of of a feed. And um, one of the things that we talked about was the um, camera angle and the posture that you're picking up. And what is your thought at the moment um, about the camera angle? Is is this kind of video with this camera angle going to be adequate to do what you want to ultimately? Um, the videos that I actually use to train this are not the newer camera angle that we decided on. They're actually the poorer camera angle. Um, the reason I did that, I actually don't know why I did that. It's a really dumb decision. I should have used the better camera angle. Um, but just to add on a bit of an answer there as well with regards to how I'm going to detect these behaviours is this graph here that I've just put up on the screen is it's got the position of the Y and the X. Um, obviously, the dot represents the actual body part. And you can see, so as an example, if there might be, this is just in a hypothesis, that if the dots are down here and they're down here for a set period of time and they don't move, that we can say that that cow is definitely eating. But it might be that when the dot is up here, that we know they aren't eating, but then when the dot is moving loads, so we've got loads of dots 
within a really small region of interest that that cow is sorting. That might be something that we see when we dive further into it. Well, we'll have to see that when we dive further into it. But I have a I have a follow up question about labeling and um, the the function of the model at at this stage is. Um, I have two questions. They're related to each other. Well, one of them is um, you said that it took a long time to do the transfer learning part of the model and that a humble laptop wasn't up to it. And um, you had to pay Mr. Google to uh, get enough compute. You should claim that back, by the way, on your uh, PhD and put in the claim for that. That'll be a that'll be a bargain to pay you back for. But um, how long did it take to do the training on 45 times 20 training images approximately? So initially it was around about half a day. And then when I reduced it down, um, so initially it was trying to change half a million iterations and that took around about three days and I didn't even let it finish running because when I realized that the multi-step was telling it to run half a million iterations I was like mm -mm -mm. then I changed it again to a hundred thousand iterations which took around about half a day but when I did the ten thousand iterations it did reduce it to around about three four hours um so it wasn't as wasn't as bad it was a lot quicker so so when you're testing the video uh, how fa how long does that take? Is that really fast? That was really quick. Yeah, that was a lot faster. Yeah. OK, so my, my last question, I see some hands have gone up in the chat and I'll pass it over to them and I'll shut up for a while after this question is uh, if it's fast to test the model. Um, it seems to me you need to immediately you want to immediately test it on the um, camera from a different angle and see if the features can transfer and still pick up those features as they probably can, or at least they possibly can. So I'd be really interested to see that, you know, ASAP. Yeah. Well, okay, okay, thank you, Ed. All right, there's some questions up. I see I, James has put his hand down, but Matt's hand is up. So Matt? Uh, yeah, so it's, it's a follow-on from a question you asked, Ed, which I'm, I'm not sure if I heard qu quite correctly. I think you asked George whether she labeled every frame in the video is that correct george uh depending on the frame rate yes right well in in the in the gui for that um uh i forget what it is we're looking at now but i noticed that the, there's a function in there where you put a load of videos into a folder maybe half a dozen videos and you ask it to look through them and it gives you a subset of a few frames from each video which it thinks are significantly different difficult or different and worth training if you sort of mean rather than training every frame in every video um, which makes it a lot more manageable and and productive yeah i do remember that actually that was in that was further up here actually yeah so that, that's the sort of workflow you put it into, um, you know, you put your videos in a folder and then it analyzes I mean, it uses something like I think you can choose. It uses k-means clustering and all sorts of different statistical things to yeah. work out which, which which frames are different enough from <laughs> other frames to be useful as training. Um, yeah, I'll have to investigate that a little bit more because I think you, you're definitely right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the second thing was about the, the uh, dead time at the end of each video. Um, at the moment, the, w because you're using motion, you know, to capture the videos so that you uh, know that one video is finished because the, heads, the cows keep putting their heads in and out of the bins. Mm -hmm. You sort of need to stop somewhere. Otherwise, you end up with a great big long video um, or, or a hot, whole load of tiny videos every time its head goes out, which might actually be what you want. I don't know, but um, that's why originally the, the long delay was put in and that's something that can be configured in in motion. Yeah, I mean, I think we should keep the long delay because I don't think there's anything wrong with it when capturing the data. But I think okay. for the purpose of training the video, there's loads mm. of refining that you can do, just like okay. when you do like grayscaling on images for computer mm. vision. Okay. It's just that, those kind of things just to shorten yeah. the OK, and the last thing, which is probably the most important thing of all, is that um, I'm not sure if it's been made very clear that 
the, the, the this produces poses, which is series of linked points, you know, ears, nose, and so on. But you can't look at any one of those and uh, say what behavior is going on. What happens next is that your your series of these poses is put into another... Well, you did mention it at the beginning, actually, because you said there were lots of different softwares that do it. But that's the kind of the whole point of doing this pose thing, is that you get this series of different poses, which another AI yeah. then, then analyzes and says, oh, well, this is what you'd expect to see if the cow is eating or, or yeah. whatever. Just to kind of build on what you just said, yeah, just to kind of strengthen it a bit is deep lab cut is not a behavior estimation tool it's a pose estimation tool that you can then use the output to input into another model to do behavioral estimation exactly yeah they're all good points um i think uh, sarah's got her hand up um my questions are a bit more about the animal side of things. Um, I was interested in your um, better camera position. Where have you positioned it to be better? So you can see here, it's quite kind of bird's eye viewy of, yeah. of the cow. Whereas what we've actually done is we've taken it further out and put it at an angle. So it's kind of looking as if you were stood looking at a cow feeding, basically. That's, okay. the, new, that's the new camera position. Um, and my other question or um, suggestion, would you look at tongue presence in each of the frames as an additional? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, we are. I do want to do that. It's just this was kind of like me learning. Yeah. And then, <laughs> but yeah, definitely. The more videos I have, the more I want to put tongue, tongue presence. Yeah. In. Because they um, use their tongue mainly for the sorting and eating. Yeah. So you'd get more of a being able to predict behaviours pr from the po um, poses then. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Cool. Hey, James. Hi, Georgie. Um, sorry if you've already covered this. Um, Part of me does wonder if you have noticed me rummaging around in those bins. Um, <laughs> but I, I suppose the question is, I mean, it's, it's quite interesting whenever you talk about animal pose to me. Um, for the simple reason that if you look at the gross safe, whenever it's full, they're almost, and, and, and you can't see it with that camera angle. So I was wondering if you could see it with your new one. They're very much reaching up and then down. It looks like quite an uncomfortable eating position down into what you've then got roughly in that one at the bottom and then down at the bottom where they're really stretching out. So you've got kind of this different behaviours at different angles and then different trajectories the whole way down through that bin. Mm -hmm. um, which I suppose my question is, how are you dealing with that? Well, I think the new video is a is a lot better at at kind of getting the full picture, but I do think you have brought up a good point because that obviously is going to impact their behaviours. Um, yeah. So maybe it kind of you know gives us more questions than answers. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's quite because. One of the interesting, well, the thing about an animal eating is that as it eats more, the disappearance is greater. So by definition, the posure will have to change to access it. Um, and I just, I'd assume as long as you cover all of those elements within reason, um, I hope mm -hmm. I'm not speaking out of turn there, that that would actually be picked up. Um, but it's that's with with this, that's always going to be an issue because it doesn't matter. It may be exaggerated in a gross safe bin, but if you went round the corner to the other side of the shed you still would see the same in the big troughs anyway. Yeah, uh, exactly. I mean, it might kind of be that, like, thinking at, thinking how to combat that is we actually score the feed. So we might kind of come up with a category of, like, zero to three. Zero being very shallow bin and three being a full bin. Um, and then see, OK, based on those three categories, what is the difference with the behaviours to see the level of impact and if there is an impact? Um, which is something that we could do the more we have labelled, we can add that metadata in. 
Yeah, you could always score it up the side, would be another yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. That's me. Lovely. Thank you guys so much for like interacting. It makes a it makes a big difference. <laughs> and I appreciate all of your comments as well. They're super helpful. Well, it's really good to see this progress. Um, I am uh, I have been waiting for uh, you to hit the GPU wall, so I'm glad you've gone to Colab. Then the next leap will be, uh, you know, GitHub. So I see you're using. Um, I see you're using um, your your Google Drive account, and you can link it up that way. But it's just a faff, especially I think once you get a few videos, and you're having yeah. to shift those around. The thing I was going to suggest is that I've been working with sound files in Python recently, um, mm -hmm. and you'll definitely be able to uh, find a library that will allow you to read in a, a movie file as an object and just trim it automatically and then you won't have to do any processing beforehand because that'll take a lot of time you'll just be able to do that programmatically easily i should think mm -hmm. yeah i agree i agree i mean one of like the things that they kind of really emphasize on this whole kind of i mean this is a good image but it's 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 super true and it is like they extract the frames label the frames but then this whole refine the frames extract outliers of the frames like it is a lot of thought and effort is put into getting those kind of labels and that information in the model as clearly as possible without any kind of noise label noise going on in the background so so yeah i didn't want to stop you when you showed this slide but uh, so where do you think you are in this uh in this diagram at the moment you've got the red so I've, box I've, boxes I've got this, so I've got this video going, um, but I haven't analysed the difference in the points. So, for example, this being in this region of interest compared to this being in this region of interest. So, therefore, the movement of these three poses put together from this frame to that frame, what behaviour does that mean? Like, how does that interpret into being an actual behaviour from an animal? That is where I'm at. Do you think you have the raw footage that's got the... Um, displays the behaviors, some of the behaviors anyway that you're interested in yet? Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Okay. And what are you going to show us next week? Um, or a week hopefully, after? Week hopefully, after? A, a Simba model. So I, I've, I have started working on this just to give you a bit of a summary. Is there's all different types. So it's in this deep lab uh, cut utilization folder um, and there's all different models that you can use um, one of them is i'll actually just tell you ed just while you're you're on here but it's it's a book um, that they've talked about and it's called time series analysis by state space methods have you heard of that before yeah yeah so that is one of the the, the methods that they use to extract the behavior, what the actual behavior is. Well, not what the actual behavior is, because you, you should know what the actual behavior is, but how it kind of pumps out that output. <laughs> yeah, OK, interesting. Yeah, so there's, there's loads of different ways like that. In fact, I'll just click, I'll just click on this and I'll show you the link. So yeah, there's uh, clustering tools, um, machine helper package tools, um, 3D deep lab cut. I've got a helper package. Um, I think that's it. And then the Simba one, which is this one at the top. Looking well, at, um, go on. Sorry, sorry. I was I'm... just going to say, while you're doing this part, are you are you collecting data right now? Is, is that something that's ongoing? Are you have you got the cameras deployed? Yeah, yeah, they're all up and running. They're all up and running. Um, so you must be getting lots and lots of video footage now. Yeah, so I got I got some more today as well. Um, but the RCD had turned off, so I did miss out on a couple of days. But I've got from the 19th, I've got two days, two overnight runs when we use the battery. And then we've got the 19th of April to the 21st of April. And then we've got today from around about half 11 um, till whenever it decides to turn off again. <laughs> 
Um, okay, well, thanks for in the last five minutes here. Any final comments, questions, proclamations? All right, uh, well, thanks, George. Thanks everybody for coming. And um, I think we'll next week, I'm on, then we're taking a week off and we'll see George back here in a few more weeks to get the uh, the final model predicting hours of video. Lovely. Thank you guys for the interaction. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. See you later. Cheers.